Hi guys, this is Erica Weston with Fox Sports Midwest, and you're listening to my favorite St. Louis Blues hockey podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. Hi there, everyone. I'm Haley Wickenheiser, and this is Let's Go Blues Radio, past to the future. This is Jeff of Let's Go Blues Radio, and we're continuing the past to the future segments of uh, the quarantine edition of the show. Uh, today, I'm joined by Lubos Partechko, former St. Louis Blue, spent some time here and in Atlanta, and uh, is also now back in the States as well, uh, coaching junior blues, coaching junior predators, kind of all over the place. Uh, Lubos, thank you very much for joining the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Always happy to be here. Um, so what, uh, so go ahead, I'll go ahead and ask, what age groups are you coaching right now? Right now? Well, I, I finished coaching, uh, the U16 group and, uh, next year I'm moving up to, uh, the U18. So it's just like kind of going with the team, um, in St. Louis, I was coaching 14, 15, you know, and then, uh, I moved to, uh, Nashville, I was coaching 16 and now I'm going to go to 18 and then we'll see where that's going to go. So, but yeah, but, um, Finished the 16 and moving on to 18. That's awesome. So pretty much the same kids you were already coaching. You get to continue on with them. Is that how that works? Yes, pretty much. Awesome. Very cool. Um, awesome. So what's it like for you, uh, somebody who, you know, obviously learned the, the North American game in the 90s and 2000s, and now you're coaching. What's that like uh, making the change from being a player to being a coach? It's actually very... Uh, very interesting because uh you know once you start playing hockey and and when you're when you're uh when you're an active player and you're you're at that pro level and you're growing up and then you you you're you know you're always sitting down and going on the ice and uh complaining about the coaches and <laughs> you know all that but when once you once you stop and then you know you, the transition into coaching i thought it was going to be like you know no problem but it's actually not that easy or not that simple just jumping into coaching and especially the youth level so uh for me it was a very interesting path uh the transition it was very smooth because i've been you know fortunate enough to be with uh some of the really good coaches and great people and and you know in the youth program so uh for me it was pretty interesting but um and a good learning process for me to get into but uh uh, now since the games has changed, you know, since when I played and, and now the game's all about skill and speed. And, you know, that's how we were kind of taught in, in, in Europe and all that is coming in here. So it's actually pretty good for me, you know, to kind of, um, teach the kids or, or, you know, in their youth development, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, bring that European game into here. So it was pretty, pretty good. That's uh, that's great. So um, I know for me, when I coached, I, the hardest part for me to get used to was, you know, when you're a player, you can go out and you can say, okay, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to score a goal. I'm going to set up a big play. I'm going to make a big defensive play. Now you can't do that. Now you're the ones that are telling those guys to do that. Is that one of the more difficult things for a former former professional as well? Well, like, you know, like I was, like, like I told you, like for me, you know, jumping into coaching, it was uh, kind of like same mentality as, 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 as I, as I was, uh, as I was hockey player. Like I wanted to win every game, you know, and mm -hmm. I wanted to go out there and I just, I was very, very into it. Very, you know, like passionate about winning our, you know, games and like every player, like, you know, just being perfect pretty much. But, you know, what I've learned, you know, in, into the youth development or youth uh, hockey game, you, you can't really do that. Like, as far as a coach, like you, like for me, it's not all about winning championships or w winning every game. My main goal or my main, that's what I've learned pretty much last couple of years, that my main priority is development. 
and developing each individual because every kid is different and every kid every kid needs a different you know guidance every kid needs a different uh development path and you know not everybody can make it but for me as a development coach you know i have to be able to make sure that first of all he enjoys the game he enjoys coming to the practice every single day you know uh enjoys going to practice and you know and especially the the um i would say um personal like the communication with him you know has to be way different than than you know what i used to being at the pro level because they're not pros so for right. me you know and, and when i kind of learned that from you know a lot of those uh, coaches that i've been around and that's what pretty much they taught me about you know like this is you know uh development this is not about winning because you know the kids like especially the young age when they're like 13 14 and 15 that's the most important age for them to kind of find that window where they can develop each and every year something different. So, you know, this this was pretty interesting path for me. And, and now I, I think I kind of understand uh, what it really needs to be done. And, and that's where I'm, you know, started educating myself because, you know, like once you're a player, you're just going out there and coach telling you to do this drill, do this drill. But as a coach, you kind of have to educate yourself, you know, what to do like with kid because you know every, everything is different and, and you know like you just kind of have to have what do you want to you know present the kids how you want them to develop you know what way and then you just have to kind of you know go out there so for me you know it's pretty pretty pa pretty good uh path and you know now i started to educate myself with you know the development part as well because that's i think you know for every coach out there it's very important to uh educate themselves and always every game every year the game is changing and every year you know uh there's different needs so you, you have to be able to uh know that and go with uh with the game otherwise you're just going to be stuck in a bubble and then you're not going to be able to uh get better right that makes sense uh so you mentioned uh growing up playing the european game and and you are uh as far as i can recall the first member of the former Czechoslovakia that I've had on the show. So I'm going to uh, bother you with some of my history knowledge and ask you about what it was like to grow up in Czechoslovakia. Uh, it separated in 1993. And uh, before that, you had the Velvet Revolution, which was the transition of power. Um, but what I always find that very interesting because it was nonviolent. It wasn't a violent, uh, there wasn't like a civil war, as far as I know. Maybe you'll tell me different. But uh, it kind of restored democracy in Czechoslovakia. And then, as I said, in 1993, separated into two different countries. What was that like for you growing up? I mean, you were a young man born in 1976. Um, when that all happened, I mean, what what can you tell us about growing up in Czechoslovakia when it was separating? You know, it, it, it's, it's a very good question because when I came over here, you know, everyone was asking, like, you know, where are you from? I'm from Slovakia. Do you guys have war? You know, like, I, I, I was getting all these weird uh, questions about, you know, because a lot of people kind of, you know, they didn't know. So, you know, for me, growing up in Slovakia, it was just like every other kid. You know, like, you, you, you are born and you're raised there, their, you know, culture their system what what you know so me for me it was just kind of like normal uh and you know back then we were under communism which was you know ruled by a big ussr russia so you know like everything what they were doing it was great and we had to learn their language you know at school uh so i was pretty good at russian i'm still you know i can still talk russian so you know the communism was it was very interesting very interesting because you know like the TVs, we had only two channels, channel number one, channel, channel number two. So our life was, you know, like very simple, the grocery stores and, and things like that. And, and on the other hand, like, you know, comparing to now with, you know, growing up as a hockey player, like uh, our club provided everything like the hockey equipment, hockey sticks, you know, they paid for everything. So it was pretty, pretty good from that standpoint. And, you know, uh, there was a lot of kids uh trying out and stuff but you know for me it was pretty pretty simple like we we didn't have a lot of money you know my parents just like everyone else we had, we were you know living in a in an apartment uh building where with all the other kids so uh and you know we, we were just normal kids and and uh 
and then when I came over here, that just kind of opened up the doors and opened up my eyes and then just kind of took it from there. But uh, got lucky along the way too as well. But uh, it was uh, it was interesting, uh, uh, you know, my my younghood or however you want to call it. Yeah, it's uh, I, I find that stuff very fascinating. And something else I find fascinating about it is is a guy like you and former teammates Pavel Dimitra, Michael Hanzus, who we'll talk about, and then even current NHLer uh, Zdeno Chara say you're from Slovakia. Yet a guy like Radko Gudis says he's from Czech Republic. So the question I've always had is, you know, is it like one of those where you say, okay, I identify more with this, so I'm going to say I'm from Slovakia? Or is it a region thing? What is it like that makes you decide whether you're from Czech Republic or Slovakia? Well, even, you know, even before when, when we were one country, Czechoslovakia, it was still Slovakia and Czech, Czech Republic. No, not Czech mm. Republic, it was Slovakia and Czech. But we were a country, Czechoslovakia. But we were Slovaks, and they were Czechs. They were still speaking their language. We were speaking our language, which is very similar. And then, you know, I was always, you know, saying I'm Slovakian. I was Slovakian. And I'm from Czechoslovakia back then. And then after that, when they, you know, when we split, it just, you know, like we became a country. So that was just something for me. Like, okay, I'm Slovakian, and, and they're Czech. You know, and, and and nothing really changed. Like it was not a war or anything like that. It's just more from like a politic view, and politicians wanted to do that for some reason. I don't know why. I was not really into it. I guess <laughs> Slovakian people thought we're going to do better without Czechs, but that was not the case, and still not the case. You know, Czechs are doing a lot better than Slovakians, but we're Slovakian. You know, <laughs> so that was it, pretty much. So you left Slovakia at uh, 19 years old in, in 95, uh, went on to play in the QMJHL, and we kind of talked about the European game versus the uh, the North American game. What was the transition like for you uh, going from playing in Czech Republic, Slovakia, over to playing in the QMJHL? Was it a large learning curve for you? Oh, my gosh. That was something that me coming over there, that was a – I mean – no English, you know, no French. I was not speaking any of that language. Like not like I, I, I could speak like yes, no, and that's it. Like literally, could not <laughs> understand. So, so for me, you know, going in there was very interesting. But you know, like I was a guy like I wanted to go. Like I didn't care if there was a difference because I wanted to learn the language. I wanted, you know, my goal was to go further than just going to junior. Like I wanted to stay, you know, in North America, possibly play NHL and then, you know, uh, be there. So for me, it was just kind of like I went there. Of course, it was difficult because, you know, going there, living in a family, not knowing the language, just sitting in your room all day, going to practice, coming back. You know, I had a roommate that was from Russia, actually, not Ukrainian, actually. So, you know, we talked. Um I improved my Russian language a lot <laughs> instead of English, but, uh, um, you know, that was it. But, you know, I, I didn't care. Like, I wanted to go there and, and play hockey, and, and I didn't know what to expect, and I just went there, and I said to myself I could always come back anytime, you know, if it's not going to work. So I went there, and it was just kind of like the culture shock was very – not difficult. It was good difficult because, you know, going from Slovakia into Canada where Canada, they had everything. Right. And, right. and so it was just like, so it was just like going from, you know, very, not a poor country, but like, you know, just going into Canada and, and living like a good life. So that was, for me, it was great. Like I loved it. And, you know, the hockey was great. I learned a lot. So just kind of took that next step and, and, you know, took off from there. But, um, it was uh, the, the language part was difficult, but I think, you know, I, I they got us like a like a teacher. So we started learning and by the December. So it was pretty good. Like, you know, my English took off really fairly easy and, and, and quickly. So by December, I was like communicating and I had no problem. So it was good. Yeah, I remember you doing interviews with the Blues when you first came up. And I remember thinking, man, he speaks English really well. And so now hearing that. You had just learned it, I mean, years before that, just a couple of years. That's pretty impressive. I'm sure uh, there was a huge stress on that, especially if you wanted to join the NHL and the AHL. You probably were told, hey, you, you got to learn the language if you want to stay here. So that's uh, that's interesting. 
yeah. Um, and and so you move on to the Worcester Ice Cats, uh, which again, that's uh, you go from Canada to the U.S. Play in the AHL. What was the speed like? Uh, the difference between the QMJHL and the uh, AHL. I mean, I don't remember being that big of a difference. You know, for me, the biggest the biggest part was when I, you know, like after playing as an overage twenty year old in in uh, in uh, Quebec Junior, um, I didn't get drafted. So that was, you know, that was kind of like it was, you know, I was. I was hoping I was going to get drafted to the NHL, but I didn't, which, you know, it happens. And, and I, it was kind of, I was sad, but like, it, it didn't stop me. And then, you know, my agent got me the tryout. So the, the biggest, again, another mental learning process for me was I was going to tryout. So I had only two weeks, pretty much or a week to show them or show, you know, coaches uh, from blues, because that was my first tryout that, you know, I, I deserve to be um, in this organization and to get, you know, contract. And there's a lot of kids, obviously, you know, there's like 60 or 70 kids. And, you know, so for me, that was the biggest challenge that I was facing, not necessarily the speed of the game or the game, like the mental part where, you know, I wanted to, I wanted that uh, contract, but, you know, you have to kind of be able to, because, Playing under pressure, it's not fun, but, you know, it, it, for me, just for some reason, I've always, you know, when I played under pressure, I, I, I delivered. So, uh, you know, I got the contract and then went to American Hockey League. And, and, you know, I was with all the guys that I played, you know, against in junior. So there's a lot of those guys there. So we kind of had the community there and just kind of like, you know, it was like a, like, you know, recycling process where you know those guys are going to american hockey league so i played against them and there's some older kids that you know never really played nhl so you got that experience that you know uh so it was good but yeah the american hockey league was not that big of a step the bigger step was when i got called up to the nhl that was for me it was you know the that was big like it was very it was a game changer like you know, it, it took me a while to adjust to that speed because everyone's good. Like everyone's right. good at NHL level. And, you know, that was the biggest, you know, the time and space. You don't have that much in the NHL. And especially when you're a young kid, you, you have that, you know, red jersey on sort of where everybody just want to take a piece of you. So, uh, you know, it, it was just kind of, you know, but it was good. Like I liked, I remember like today, my first NHL game, it was against Washington Capitals and Capitals and, and it was good. It, it went well, but got there, played one game after the game, my hockey bag was right in front of my saw, pack your stuff and you're going back. <laughs> so, so it was oh, another that's... mental, mental part where, you know, like, you don't know what to expect. You get called up and, you know, like, how much stuff do you pack? They don't tell you you're coming here for one game, two games, three games. So just like, you know, like, what do you do? So you just pack for, you know, whatever. I didn't know. So I pack a couple of suits and I'm going. And I got there a night before the game, played the game, going back right after the game. So, you know, it was just like, okay. So I went back and uh, it was, uh, you know, and then – there you go. And after, you know, like, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so, you get called up again. And then I played like, I don't know, like two or three games and then right back. So it's just, you know, for me, it was, it was that kind of process. It was not very easy. So, but... it, it, especially being undrafted, we had a uh, uh, Brandon Bullig on the show um, and he was also undrafted. And he talked about how it was kind of a kick in the ass to not get drafted and say, you know, Hey, it's, you know, I just got to work harder. I got to find different avenues to get there. And, uh, you know, so for you, I'm sure that, uh, going in and up and, you know, going from the AHL to the NHL as many times as you did, I'm sure that was probably something that, that kept you motivated to, to stay in the NHL. Oh yeah. It, it, it keeps you, keeps you motivated. And, you know, it, it just, sometimes that's a, that's the difference between, you know, going to the NHL, making it and, and, and be there and, and not being there. So like, you know, if you're mentally strong and you, you still believe in yourself and you believe that you can do it, you just keep going until, you know, literally you're, you can't go anywhere. And some, you know, some players, if they don't get called up within, you know, like a month or two, they go back and, you know, back to Europe or whatever. But, you know, for me, it was just like I had, 
contract for three years and I said, you know, to myself, I have three years to uh, prove myself and prove everyone else that I can, you know, be part of the NHL. And after three years, we'll see what's going to happen. So it took me about a year and a half or two almost to kind of, you know, be that player. And, and you know, but it, it, it took me some time. But, you know, some sometimes some players make the transition faster, some players not. But the biggest part of this game or any any game like hockey, basketball, whatever, the highest level, it's the mental part. Because physically you can get ready, you know, like no problem. But mentally you have to be strong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. So somebody that was kind of going in, in and out of the lineup uh, early on in his career, um, he spent, I believe, one season in Worcester. So you, I believe you played with him there as well as Michael Hanzus, and uh, yes. him being a a former uh, a for or a Slovak as well. Um, and then, of course, Pavel Dimitra fits in here as well. So when you guys all kind of make it up to the NHL and and start playing together. What was that like for you? I mean, obviously, the, the joke that Ken Wilson always made was, you know, nobody can understand them out there because they're all talking Slovakian. Nobody else speaks Slovakian in the league. So that's why they are able to, to cycle so well. And, and, you know, what was it that made you guys work so well together? I don't know. It, it, it just, you know, for me, when, when I got to St. Louis, like I didn't know. I, I knew of Pavel. Like I knew who he was. Like for me, it was, you know, like – it was uh, somebody like, you know, Idol that he was big back then. And I remember meeting or seeing him on the airplane when I was going to, for a training camp. I was sitting in on the airplane with, you know, my young buddies there that were going to St. Louis because I, I, I believe we were first year that we went there with like 11 of us from Slovakia. So, but Pavel was by himself back then. I was like, you know, that's Pavel Dimitra. That's Pavel Dimitra, you know. <laughs> so it was just kind of like, you know, and then, we didn't know what to expect, and you know, um, after that, you get to know him, you get to know, you know, Zeus, and it was just kind of really Pavel, you know, like helped every one of us, like you know, however he could, and you know, from for us to kind of when we started playing together, I think what made us click was, you know, everyone had a role in in, in the line, like you know, Pavel had a role, I had a role, and 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 Zeus was, you know, like sort of like a quarterback for us that, you know, he was the centerman and distributing the pucks. And, you know, I was hunting the pucks and getting the pucks to Pavel. And so it was just kind of like we were, you know, uh, filling for, for each other, you know, whatever we needed. And then we found our way that was really working for us, you know, like that cycling at that back in the day that, you know, it was just working for us. It was very difficult for the other teams to uh, cover. And, and we took advantage of that and, and just uh, capitalized it. So, it was good. I really had fun and enjoyed that season. Yeah, that uh, that year, especially uh, 1999, 2000, when all three of you were together pretty much the entire year, 16 goals, 39 points, and 67 games for you. Again, the Slovak pack is what a lot of people called you guys. Um, and uh, that was a hell of a hockey team. Uh, the St. Louis Blues that year went on to win the President's Trophy. Um, and obviously there was a, a – some some badness that happened at the end of the season against the San Jose Sharks, but uh, the the team that that won the the President's Trophy and one of the best teams, despite what happened in the playoffs, one of the best teams in Blues history. Uh, what what was it that I think made you guys so dominant um, against the rest of the league? I don't know. For me, like our team was like we had. I think we had. Really good goaltending, and then not to mention, like, everything went from, you know, we had two best defensemen in our team, like, you know, Al and, uh, and Chris Pronger. Like, those are the still till today when I, you know, wherever I play, like, those are the two best defensemen that I've ever played with on a team. They made such a good, di- a big difference when you were on the ice with them, and it was just so easier to play, and then, you know, they made it, and we just had, like, that you know, flow during the season that we were really good. And, and, you know, um, it was, and, and, you know, up front, we had Pavel, we had Turgeon, Scott Young, you know, uh, so it was, uh, it was, uh, it was good. It, it just, you know, when it was well balanced between, you know, the young kids and, and uh, uh, experienced veterans that, you know, were, were uh, kind of supporting, you know, and, and guiding us through the 
season. And too bad the playoffs ended up the way it, it did, but uh, you know, you always learn from it. And now I, I look back to it, you know, there's, I look back to it as a coach, you know, <laughs> and there's uh, a lot of things that I would have changed, but again, you know, it, it just, it's back then. And I was young and that was my first NHL playoff. So it just, you know, there's no excuse, but um, we just, you know, didn't get that first round. If we, I think if you would have, you know, passed through that first round at San Jose, because like this, even during the season, I remember when we were playing San Jose, like they were like known for like very, you know, um, uh, uh, like they had a couple of like very, very uh, physical team and just kind of that kind of, I guess, didn't really play for us. And they, you know, and then the playoff, they took another notch and, and you know, they beat us. And, and, you know, obviously we missed Pavel that year, that first round. Uh, he would have made huge difference. I'm pretty sure. So, but it is what it is. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So, obviously, Dimitra being one of the the top players on the team, obviously the go to guy for you and Hanzus on your top line there. Um, but he was out in the playoffs. Uh, that was a contributing factor. A lot of people say that you guys were lacking team toughness, which is interesting to say when Chris Pronger is your captain. But um, what, what do you contribute it to? What was, uh, and obviously, you know, this could be a three hour discussion with a coach on, on why this team lost in, in um, seven games to the San Jose Sharks. But what was the biggest factor for you? Was it Demetra being out of the lineup for the whole series? I think it was, you know, it, he was, he was a huge factor for our club. Like he, you know, he put up so many, you know, so much like the numbers and goals that we were, you know, needing, but I, I think from my perspective, when I look back to the playoffs and now I look back, like, like I told you as a coach, like what I've, you know, talking about myself, like what I would have liked to see for myself now, if I would have, you know, had this knowledge and, and if I would have, you know, known what I know now, if I would have gone to the game, like, you know, for me, like what I was missing, I think was that, you know, you have to pay the price in the playoffs as a player. You have to pay the price, you know, in front of the net. You have to pay the price of blocking shots. You have to, you know, pay the price to, to win the games. And and that's, I think, what I've been missing, you know, from my perspective, if I look back to it, you know, uh, that's what the playoffs is all about. It's not about, you know, the pretty plays, like where you can, like, you know, do your cycling or whatever, but you have to go into those dirty areas and you have to be able to uh, – sacrifice yourself for a team and then you know to win the games and i think that's what i lack you know from from my perspective as as a player as me you know and you know um that that was that was that was pretty much it and you know i'm not saying that would have made the difference as a team but you know as, as a team I, I think you know they kind of like i said they were very physical and then it was kind of sad but um if we would have beat them maybe we would have had a chance to regroup and just kind of learn from it and then go, you know, into second round and on and on. And Powell would have, you know, come back and gave us that extra scoring that we needed. Yeah, I agree. That was, uh, that was something I said too, was, you know, you probably just needed one or two more goals in that series. And you got to think Pavel Dimitra provides that. So that's, uh, that was a big part of, of them, of the, the team losing, but, uh, moving on, talking about the blues, you, uh, you moved on there, uh, 2000, 2001, Dimitra stays with the club. Hanzus gets traded, uh, in the Keith Kachuk deal. Then you move on the next season to Atlanta. Uh, did you guys remain in contact? The three of you after that, were you all pretty good friends or was it, uh, kind of moving on and, and making new friends with your new teams? Oh, yeah, we stayed, you know, stayed friends, played for a national team, you know, went on uh, Olympics, played there in 2006, you know, um, played in world championships. So we stayed friends and, you know, back in uh, during the summers, we always go see each other, you know, and have fun and did different, you know, uh, charity games and events. So we stayed, you know, as friends, like we're still, you know, friends as of now, like we always stay in contact and, you know, and then moving on to Atlanta, you know, we gain new friends. So that's something that you always, you know, you keep your old friends and then you gain new. So 
Uh, it was something interesting. I, you know, I, I've got to know a lot of great people in Atlanta, so uh, it was good. What made you come back to St. Louis after you retired? My wife's from St. Louis. I met my wife here in St. Louis or in St. Louis. And ever since we, you know, like we stayed together and got married and every summer we would go back. And like I said, America is America. You know, I'm, I really love, I love it here. And then, um, and I just wanted to stay here. And, you know, that's one of the, you know, reasons that I got married to American Girl, because it's just like, you know, I found something that I really wanted to be with. And uh, that's it. Yeah. So obviously, you know, the overlying thing here as we talk about Paolo Dimitra is the unfortunate plane crash with the locomotive uh, so long ago now. Obviously, you said you're still friends with Michael Hanzu, so I'm sure there's still other NHL players that uh, you talk to on a consistent basis. Um, you know, obviously this affected you in a very negative way as, as it did me, just somebody who was a fan and, and met him at fan events. But, you know, how did you find out about the crash and um, how did it affect you personally? Well, it was, I, I found out like in like, um, they were supposed to, they were supposed to fly into uh, and play a game with against our team in my hometown where I was playing, and he was I did in, not know that. in there. So he texted me. You know, like we talked night before. He's like, "Hey, uh, I'm we're going there. We're gonna have. Can you get me, um, you know, a, a box for my family?" And and uh, so they're coming in to see me. And I'm like, "For sure, absolutely." So I got him a box. You know, got him everything. And then in the morning before they were taking off on that flight, he texted me, you know, everything's all set and all that stuff, you know, so we were talking, he's like, yeah, you know, and I was, I, I was practice, I had practice that morning. So I was at the practice, you know, and then after practice, like, you know, I was looking at my phone and, you know, I, I had a message, whatever, so I, I responded and then, and then all of a sudden, uh, one of my teammates ran up to my car and is like, do you know what happened? I'm like, no, what happened? He's like, yeah, the plane went down. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, the plane went down. And I was like, I literally, like, it froze me. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. And I picked up my phone and I called Pavel and straight, you know, like, I just didn't know what to do. Like, it was just really, I honestly, like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, you know, like in shock. Like, you're, you know, this is something that it's like almost like you're a family member, like, you know, because we were that close just like, you know, what happened. So it was very, very tough at first to take it. And, you know, um, it just still kind of think about it, you know, think about him and, you know, it's just, it's tough and it was not pleasant, but, you know, we just have to move on from things like that. And, and, you know, remember all the good things that what happened with him and, and, and go from there. But yeah, it was, uh, it was not pleasant. Yeah, no, I, um, again, I, I didn't know him personally like you did. And, and obviously there were other players involved in the crash that, um, that I had met in the past. And, um, so it affected me as, as just somebody who's a, a fan of the game and covers the game. So for you, I can only imagine, um, how that made you feel, but I wanted to ask you one more question about Pavel. Um, you mentioned that, that you, uh, you know, were kind of starstruck a little bit by him when you first met him ended up becoming friends, obviously, and, and playing together, playing against each other. Um, what do you think is the, the most important lesson you learned from Pavel Dimitra? <laughs> I know, tough question, tough question. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're good. There's a, it just, you know, for me, when you get to know a player like his caliber, right? So you, you always, you always have idols, right? So you, you like, you have idols, like, you know, you, you idolize, oh, you want to be like them, you want to be, but you don't really know them personally. You don't really know what they do to take to that level. You don't really know you all, you, you, you see all the good stuff, like the, the highlights of, you know, how much money they have, how, what kind of life they live, but you don't really know what it really takes to get there. And for me, you know, getting to know him and, and understanding him and, you know, the lesson that I've learned is to how to become, you know, that player, like what it really takes to be or to get to the 
top. Obviously, you need talent, but the work ethic, what he had, you know, like he was able to separate all that, you know, like, okay, we're having fun, we're having fun. But when it's time to go to work, it's work time. And, you know, those guys, it's just not like for him, but not just him, but being around like, you know, like Chris Pronger, Al McKinney's all these superstars, like you see behind the scenes what it really takes to go to the next level. It, it's unbelievable what they do to be those guys. It's not just like, oh, they rely on their talent. But, you know, the the, the fact that, you know, the lesson that I learned from Pavel was, you know, like when it's time to work, you have to put everything aside and you have to focus on that. And you have to work to get there. You have to work every single day. It's not just like you get there and you stop. And that's, I think, you know, it's just one of those things that you learn, like, you know, uh, from guys like that. So it was one of those lessons that, you know, it really helped me elevate my game and and uh, go from there. We can talk all day about how great Pavel Dimitra is, but to be honest, you know, and I know this is something that hockey players don't like to brag on themselves, but you played in three Winter Olympics for Team Slovakia. Um, that is very impressive for me. I mean, that's you got to figure that's a 12-year span where you have to be good enough to make the team. Um, would you say that's one of your bigger accomplishments in hockey? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, uh, I played – it was – too because the the first one we didn't make the main tournament we went to salt lake city but we got eliminated you know at the preliminary round or whatever you want to call it we didn't make the cut so like two olympics and i yes (laughs) i think uh i think the the biggest accomplishment was uh was the olympics uh in vancouver where we ended up uh fourth place we lost the bronze medal game and, and that was you know the biggest experience or you know i had it was it was unbelievable like you know in that olympic in in those olympic games like in vancouver all the top players all the top players from hockey everyone was there and you know uh, our team was pretty good stocked and you know i made that team and so it was it was one of the biggest accomplishments that i've uh, accomplished but it, it was the experience that you you know, you go through, it's just like, I, I tell everyone, like, I wish everyone could experience that because Olympics, that's something that, you know, it's played every four years. So it's not like every year. So it's, it's something very, for any athlete, I think that's the top of the mountain. So. Yeah. You, uh, you had some big games there. Uh, team Slovakia did in that tournament, um, lost to the Czech Republic, but you ended up beating Russia in a shootout. And then uh, the big 6 nothing win against Latvia. Um, I have this all memorized, by the way. I didn't look this up. I just remember every score. Um, but uh, what – so, I mean, obviously, as I said, you you played in, well, I guess two Olympics. I would consider it three because you played in the prelims. So let's just go ahead and call you a three-time Olympian. Um, what uh, – I mean, what is that like? Just being able to to play with your countrymen um, and the guys you probably play against consistently. Uh, you all have to come together for a tournament for two weeks and play, you know, as teammates, not against each other. Um, you know, there's a lot that's always said about that, but it's never really asked to the players how they feel. What's that like playing with uh, with you know your countrymen, but guys you probably face off against consistently every other night? Yeah. You know, like, it just kind of like, once you're in that, you know, circle, it's just kind of like, it, it, it becomes part of you. And, and, you know, you kind of are able to switch, you know, when you play for your team for the whole season, then you go to uh, represent your country, which is totally different. You know, um, everything's different. Like, it, it's not like season, you have only certain games to deliver and then if you don't you're out so that's one of the things again it's the biggest you know the the mental part is is very important in that and you know uh, that's why there's the best players in in in, in uh in the league the best players in, in the planet pretty much going there because only those guys can handle that and you know for me i've learned over, over those years is you just go out there and enjoy the moment that you're right there with them and and you know not really worry about everything else, but you at the same time have to deliver because when you get to those games, you have to win. There's no playoff, like, you know, best of seven or best of four, best of three, whatever. You have to win that one game. So it's just kind of interesting to see, and especially like Olympics, 
but they they made that really cool like that olympic village where all the athletes are all together and you get to share the stories and you get to see them like how they prepare themselves how you know it, it's really like i was telling you about pavel you know the preparation and you know getting ready it's it's amazing and not just in hockey but like you see at the olympics like all the other sports like how they do things so it's a learning process and an experience that you gain and, and you know you can you know uh give it to the young kids like that's what i'm trying to do right now you know in the youth process that you know the the coaching and explaining and then the stories that we have we talk so it's pretty interesting I should mention I, I mentioned your prelim games, but uh, the fact that you guys beat Sweden that year was uh, what and thrusted you into the uh, uh, whatever the third round, the semifinals would be against Canada, and you guys only lost that one three to two. I remember that game against Sweden because that was two years or two Olympics in a row. Sweden had been ousted earlier than uh, they were planning. Um, they were beaten by Belarus in 2002, for those that remember that. So, um, but I wanted to ask you. The, the, obviously, you've got a lot of Olympics. You've got a lot of world championships as well under your belt and then of course nhl games uh can you pinpoint what what the one of the most important games that, that might stand out in your mind as is from your career uh most important games that's yeah there's a lot you've got a lot under your belt <laughs> i mean you know every game for me it was every game was important you know like i try to prepare before every game the same, you know, but obviously you get to the point where there are games that are, you know, the most important. And I, I think for me, the most important game was game seven when we lost to San Jose and I really wanted to go to the next level, you know, to the next round, because, you know, that was for me, you know, contract and just kind of get yourself out there. But, and, and I didn't like, and I, I told you like what I've been missing, you know, I, I you know, uh, that that's, probably one of the most important games there. And then we had one game, my first, very first world championship that we were playing uh, finals. It was in Russia in 2000 finals. That was my first world championship. We were in uh, finals against Czech Republics and we lost that game. So again, you know, like those kind of games, you know, you kind of consider the most important ones. And, and then obviously when we were playing two years later, the world championship in Sweden and we beat Russia and, you know, finals and we won the world championship. So th those are the games that are probably the, you know, the championship games are the most important games that, you know, you, you want to consider, but you know, in NHL for me, that was the one that we lost. And, and I still have it in my mind. Like I, it still hunts me kind of because that could have been a game changer. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but you know, it just, I kicked myself you know, always that, that, that game, you know, if I've always, I'm always saying like what I, what I should have done better, what I should have done differently to help the team to win the game. And, and those are the things that I told you, you know, like uh, what I was lacking. And now I would have probably changed that and, and go from there. But again, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, Hey, I'll, to make yourself feel better. Um, Game seven of that series, that was my 15th birthday. My dad got me tickets. Oh. I've told this story on the show many times. We were sitting five rows from the ice, closest I ever sat as a fan. And uh, when Owen Nolan scored that goal from the red line, my heart sunk. And I, I told oh, myself yeah. then, that you know what? I just need to accept that the Blues are never going to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no offense uh, to you. It was just that. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was a dagger. So I can imagine again how that affected me. I can imagine how that affected you guys on the bench. Oh my gosh, it was it was <laughs> it was crazy. You know, it was it was difficult. And I had my uncle from Slovakia here at that game. So it was for me. It was just like, you know, uh, we were planning on the next round, and he was going to stay. And then you know, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, it, it was not. It was not pretty, but. Sorry to make you relive that. <laughs> oh, no. But then, you know, <laughs> I, I don't uh, know how many years later, Blues won the Cup, so that's good. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so were you in St. Louis when they won? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure your wife is probably a Blues fan, so um, how exciting was that for you? Obviously, you coach a bunch of kids that are Blues fans. I bet that was uh, uh, very cool. Did you, did you go to the games as a member of the alumni? 
Yes, I did go to the games, not all of them. I uh, went to, because uh, we, you know, we, we get to go to the uh, our Blues alumni box, but uh, I didn't go to the final one. No, I did. But they won the cup. Uh, they didn't win it at home. So, but we did go to the games, but, you know, everyone wanted to go. So we kind of took tur- uh, took uh, turns. But yeah, it was it was very good. I have Sonny who's sixteen plays hockey, so for him it was you know a great experience to see. And and again, it's a learning process, and it was it was good to see. And and you know for St. Louis as a city, that's something you know winning the cup. It was just like a, like a steroid shot for hockey. You know for youth hockey. You know from my perspective as a coach when I was there, like the youth hockey program and then the kids. How many kids? You know. I wanted to play hockey it was it was awesome to see because the you know I still coach to learn to play hockey in St. Louis they'll, they call it a little blues so they mm-hmm. have that program in NHL and I'm part of it so how much how many kids got signed up it was really nice to see and, and you know the hockey in St. Louis just took off and and it was really nice to see uh, who is, uh, who's the player that you keep an eye on the most on the blues? Um, you know, obviously being a fan is a tough question for a former player, but who do you think has, uh, had, you know, kind of catches your eye whenever they're on the rink? Current blues players. Yeah. I, my, my, even before he came here, he was one of my favorite guys to watch because when I watch hockey games, uh, I, I, I like to watch teams that, you know, the players that I really like. So I don't watch every game. I obviously was watching Blues, and I still watch Blues. But one of the guys that I watched before was uh, Ryan O'Reilly, which, you know, he just, to me, like, that's – he was underrated before, and now he finally got his cup. And, you know, like, he kind of, you know, got into the – um, got into the spotlight. But he's the guy that I really like to watch because – the way he, he, again, like he's one of those guys that, you know, shows the true professionalism, like, you know, the preparation and, you know, how he plays the game, plays the game the right way. You know, uh, he sacrifices himself. And that's why I think one of the reasons why Blues won the Cup because of him. Yeah. Well, Con Smythe winner. I completely agree with you. Um, is there one guy on the team that you look at, uh, maybe even this past teams that you say, that guy plays a lot like Lubos Portechko? Is there any of those out there? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell you if, if you know, like, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to see, you know, like, and, and, and another one of the, another player that I really like is uh, Jaden Schwartz, uh, you know, the yeah. way he plays and, you know, he, he's kind of, he's, he's not, he doesn't play like he's way more skilled than I was. And, but, you know, he, he, he's an, another guy that is kind of, you know, in the shadow of another guys, but you know, he delivered during the playoffs and that's what you're looking for. And he's, he's been, you know, like those, those guys that, you know, O'Reilly Schwartz, like those guys were just very, very fun to, you know, really fun to watch. And, and, you know, um, it was, uh, it was great, but yeah, Schwartz was really good. And, and another guy, so there's three of them, Barbashev. He oh, played, course. you know, he was, uh, he was one of those guys that, you know, you would look at and, you know, that's what probably we needed, you know. But anyway, yeah, he's one of those guys that I, I, I really enjoy watching as well. Yeah, he's he's fun to watch. He's a guy that um, I always say you can insert him anywhere in the lineup and he's gonna he's gonna fit just fine. So that's that's a that's the type of player, utility player that you want on your team. So I'm hundred percent with you, Lubos. Um Lubos, thank you very much for joining me. This has been a lot of fun having you on, talking current and former blues. Um, I want to give you time to promote anything you want to promote, uh, whether it's instant Instagram, uh, your social media channels, where people can find the, uh, the, the, the junior predators, anything you want to give out that, uh, people, you know, that, that where people can check you out either online or in real life. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a big social media guy. I don't know why. I just I, I follow a lot of people, but you know, they can check me out on Instagram, Klubos uh, Dad uh, and then obviously I, I I'm in Nashville uh, working for the uh, Total Package Hockey TPH, 
Uh, we have Instagram and Nashville Junior Predator. So uh, that's where I work right now and, and help young kids uh, go through their development. And, you know, it's really fun uh, to be here in Nashville. As you know, the city is great and the, the hockey is booming here as well. So the, those are the only two things. And, and you know, that's it. Yeah, no, I, I love the city of Nashville. You picked a good place to live. I've I've been there a couple times, seen a couple games there, as, both as media and as a fan, and but all experience have, has been fantastic. So, uh, fine city for the young Bartichko to grow up in and play <laughs> hockey. Uh, how long oh, until yeah. he's he's drafted in the NHL? When's that going to happen? <laughs> well, I, I have no idea. <laughs> NHL is <laughs> it's a tough cookie to crack, and you know you have to be really 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 good and you know he's he's on a good path and who knows where you know where his hockey uh journey will take him but uh certainly i'll support every way that you know everything whatever he needs uh, i'll be there for him and then uh, we'll see where where that's gonna take him but um uh, he still have time he's 16 so he's still have you know school and then he needs to get you know his college degree and that's all i care about right now and uh, when, as soon as he gets that he can choose whatever he wants to do after very cool very cool well lubos thank you very much for joining the show i really appreciate it yeah my pleasure anytime what are you doing why are you watching me right now i don't you know you can be podcasting Let's Go Blues Radio right now and check out an a interview about somebody who's a prospect in the organization? What are you doing? Why are you watching me? Get out of here! Go! Go! Go!